Yep. Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seventh GSS. Is this seven or eight? So we've managed those seven with some of the magicians and some stories. Okay, some number. Um, okay, so uh, Chris will be talking again this semester. Let's give him a thank so that he can come back. This is maybe the winner this semester so far. Unless some of you want to step up to the game. Um, I'm always waiting for talks. Yeah. So today, uh, Chris will talk about Shannon's Shannon capacity. Yeah. yeah. So, so, that's, so that's what we'll talk about today. Shannon capacity. So this is just an information theory problem, kind of, well, at its motivation and not at its heart. Um, so in information theory, what usually you have is you have two people. You want to send information from one to the other across some sort of noisy channel where the data can get maybe corrupted somehow, jumbled around, natural uh, coding questions or for example, hamming codes where some number of bits could be flipped in your message and you want to be able to recover the original message. In Shannon capacity, I think the best way to understand it is to imagine trying to communicate between two people if one person has really messy handwriting. So maybe, I don't know, this person also can only write maybe five different symbols. You know, they can write an A, they can write an O, they can also, like, you know, kind of write a P, maybe. Oh, it's really bad. They can also write a Y, maybe, maybe this is a Y, and also, I don't know, a Q. Uh, but if you didn't see me say what these were, it would be very easy to confuse some of these symbols with each other, especially if they were written a lot sloppier than I'm writing right now. Just imagine grading your students' homeworks. <laughs> so the thing is that we can confuse some of these symbols. And if I told, if I said, if I sent you, you know, like A, this weird P, you know, well, you don't know maybe. Is this an A? An A, a Q, or an O. It's really our question is, uh, handwriting is really messy and we can't tell. So if I want to be able to communicate with someone else and you know make sure that they're able to recover my message perfectly, we should only use symbols that cannot be confused with each other. So let's draw on this guy, you know, how we can confuse the symbols. So for example, A and O could be confused. Probably. This guy, yeah, easy to confuse. These guys can be confused. Those guys confuse, those guys confuse. Well, I'm not really going to confuse O and I think that's a Y. I'm not really going to confuse P and Q because the tails go the other way. I'm also not going to confuse A and Q or Y and A. So in fact, this is my confusability graph right here. So we can ask the question, how much information can we send so we want to only use symbols which can't be confused. And the question is, how much information can we send? Can be sent in an n-bit string. And by bit here, I'm just using bit as a general thing for simple, not actually zero one. one okay. mean by use symbols which cannot be confused? So we're going to send messages which only use these symbols. Yeah. But as I said, if I sent you an A, mm -hmm. you're not going to know whether it's an A, a Q, or an O. So do we arrange it like ahead of time that if you see something that looks like yeah. a Q and O, you actually mean Q? Mm -hmm. okay. So for example, we could send messages where we decide we're only ever going to send the letters A and, and P. I can't even tell what that is. Only send letters A and P, and now if you get a message, well, I'm not going to ever confuse the A and P, 
So I can just know, well, if it looks like an A, it's the A. If it looks like the P, it's a P. Wait, but what yeah. if I see an O, the O looks like an A and a P? Okay, well this is... This is the bit of a, a nuisance. <laughs> We're basically, uh, this graph is the idea of these are the only two symbols which can be confused. If I only send you A and A's and P's, you're never going to think that an A is a P and a P is an A. Okay. You're only getting a symbol with A and P's. So this is a thing if you're, so what you're talking about is some like bit flipping in some sense. And in that case, we could, um, if we had bit flipping, we could just modify this graph. Well, if I see an O, I'm going to confuse it with these, and then you might say, well, then I could kind of confuse an A with a P, right? Well, then we'll just draw another edge. And it still fits into this framework of the edges tell you these symbols can be confused. So in this case, I can only pick two symbols to use and avoid all confusion, right? So pick two symbols, two symbols, two non-adjacent symbols. say I uh, A and the P. Let's try to draw them worse. Okay, so how many messages can I send? So you can send two to the N messages. I can't stop messages, probably. Two to the N messages. Or we'll say on average, uh, each entry communicates two pieces of information, which is exactly true. We don't even need to say, on average, each entry can be one of two things, two pieces of information. Can we do better? Well, with this naive approach, no. I pick the two symbols. I'm only going to send information using those two. I can't do better than two to the end messages, or on average, having each bit. But what if I added some redundancy into how I'm actually going to send these guys? So instead of just saying each entry in this message is its own symbol, what if I say group them together into chunks of size two? So why don't we say our message is the following thing, where each pair um, is a symbol. And I'll use symbol in quotes here. Namely, I get a message and I'm going to interpret each pair as its own thing. Well, how much information can we send now? Again, using the same model. <clears throat> well, let's look at the following set. I can write this down. O, O. Uh, I'm not even going to be able to read some of these. A, I think this is the Q. Let's do that. Uh, we have the A and the weird P. We have the Y and the A, and we have the P and the Y. So I've written down five pairs here. And let's look at these guys and notice that between any two pairs, we can either distinguish the first symbol or distinguish the second symbol. Namely, just looking at these guys, well, I can't tell the O apart from the A, However, I can tell the O apart from the Q based on this picture over here. So if I were giving these two pairs, I would be able to tell them apart. All right, I have five pairs. So putting this into the end models, we can send five to the, well, we group them into pairs, right? <clears throat> so N over two messages. by using this type of encoding scheme, adding this redundancy. <clears throat> or, on average, each individual uh, entry communicates square root of five uh, pieces of it. And the thing to notice is that square root of five is certainly bigger than two. So by adding redundancy, we were actually able to send more information by doing this. And this is essentially what channel process <coughs> is, is the maximum amount of information you can do by grouping things together into long strings.
So I want to define this formally. It's really just a graph theory problem. Anish pointed out that this is not actually a discrete math seminar. So I'm probably obligated to define what a graph is, right? <laughs> OK, let's do it. I mean, honestly, you guys have probably all seen graphs, but we'll still define it. So really, graphs go back a um, bit of histor history uh, to uh, Descartes. I mean, that's not how you spell Descartes. I think there's an S in there. Right? They really go back to Descartes with the invention of the Cartesian core, <laughs> Cartesian product, right? So we have two sets, x and y, and their Cartesian product, x cross y, is, you know, all pairs x, y, x is in x, y is in y, lovely. And we have a function, function from x to y, and the graph of the function f, well, that's just the set of all pairs x comma f of x, such that x is in x. So we know tons of graphs, right? For example, this is the graph of f of x equals x. You know, this is the graph f of x equals x squared. All right, so we've defined graphs. <laughs> Not the graphs we're talking about. There's thanks, Grace. <laughs> we have graphs, anyway. All right, so let's actually uh, do a bit of graph theory. So what were we saying before? We have a graph G, um, which is the, we have a G graph. And we're going to send, to send messages um, using the vertices G as our symbol set. And if I have U adjacent to V in G, this means that U and V are confusing. I don't know how to spell confusible, apple, oh. Which is exactly what we had earlier. Earlier we had the five cycle, which described our confusibility graph. All right, so what does it mean, just in the first setting, to be able to send a message you know, each entry meaning its own thing. Well, that meant that we just chose an independent set and used that as our symbols, right? So with uh, groups of size one, so pairing them up into size just of themselves, most information, let's say most average info per bit, well, that was just the independence number of the graph. We chose an independent set to begin with. We were only allowed to use those entries because they don't have any edges between them. And therefore, on average, or actually exactly in this case, each coordinate of my message actually conveys alpha of g bits because that's how many options it had. However, what if we grouped into size two? Well, what does it mean for two pairs to be adjacent in some sense? If I have a pair u1, v1, and a pair u2, v2, these are confusable. If, well, both of them have to be confusable, right? So we have, would have to have u1 equals u2, well, let's say the following uh, let's say u1 adjacent to u2 or equal and v1 adjacent to v2 or equal. Right. That would say that I would not be able to tell these two things apart. So what I could do is I could form actually a graph product. This is essentially lending itself to a graph product and it's something that we call the strong so let's define it quickly. So if I have two graphs G and H, the strong product, which we denote like this, the little box with an X in it, uh, I can explain why that is later, is formed as follows. Well, the verts um, is simply the Cartesian product of the two vertex sets. 
And we have that u1, let's say u1, u2 is adjacent to v1, v2, if and only if, well, uh, let's say here, I guess, for each i, ui is either adjacent to vi or uh, ui equals. So that's exactly our graph. So for those of you logicians, this is similar to the direct product of graphs. Except put a loop at every vertex first, and then get rid of the loops after. For those of you who don't like it, or, or you could also say it's the Cartesian product union with the direct product. So let's do a little example. Let's explain this symbol here. Why is it that symbol? Well, if we take the path on two vertices, and multiply it by the path on two vertices, this gives us the symbol. And this is actually somewhat, uh, not everyone does this, but some people do. For example, the Cartesian product in graphs is oftentimes denoted like this, and it's exactly what P2 times P2 would look like. Also, the direct product with a normal x, that's P2 times P2. A little trick, not everyone does it though. Uh, everyone understand this graph product. Okay, so using this graph product, on average, how much information can we convey if I just group into uh, pairs? Well, now I should be using an independent set in the square of the graph, G. So the average amount of information, uh, info, or I guess most average info per bit, well, I can send that many messages-ish, right? Or, sorry, squared here. I'm using pairs. That's how many choices I have. But each pair takes up two slots, right? So I should actually take the square root here. Yeah. Um, sorry, just to clarify, why do you say most? Uh, could you el illustrate any cases where you get the low with that uh, information? Well, I mean, here's the thing is, I group into pairs, but I'm really stupid about it, right? I'm just not optimal. Mm -hmm. Also, when I say here, the most info, I could have just selected to send only a single bit, right? So when I'm saying most, I mean, like, mm -hmm. what's the optimal thing I could do by, by this type of strategy? And we can generalize this, namely, if you group into pair, like, group into strings of length n, then the average amount of information, the best you could do, well, you pick an independent set in the nth guy, extend this naturally, but then each one of these symbols actually takes up n of your slots. So we should take And now we can define Shannon capacity. Question. Yeah. Is there is any reason why we want all of those words that if you get one single bean of a single lens? Um, there's no reason a priori. I mean, this is. Uh, maybe if you use my guess, two or no. Three. So uh, I can I can justify why it's basically going to be best to, to do it with all the same. It has to deal with some either super or submodularity. I forget which one's which. Uh, that says yeah. Somehow I could. I won't give you a formal proof, but like. I think you can turn what I'm going to say into a proof that it is best to use the same length. Or at least it's not going to hurt you. All right. Well, for, for certain lengths. For some lengths, it might hurt you. Okay. Shannon capacity. That's not how you spell that. <laughs> All right. We denote it by a big theta of g. I have no idea why. And it's defined to be the supremum over all n alpha of the nth strong product of g with itself to so the 1 over So it's exactly this theoretical maximum of how much information, average information, can be sent per bit in this type of uh, setting. OK. This is what most likely you could turn into a proof. I want to claim that uh, I'm not going to give a formal proof of this. But I also want to claim it's the same as the limit. And 
and this is because this function is actually either sub or super modular, I can never, or multiplicative. I always forget what all these things mean. Anyway, I don't have to take a test. <laughs> so let's just notice that if I take the independence number of, say, g to the power of some uh, k plus l, well, what's going to happen here, this is bigger than or equal to the independence number g to the k times the independence number of g to the x. Now, why is this true? In general, if I just say alpha of the strong product of g and h is bigger than or equal to the product of their independence numbers, this is fairly clear because I can take an independence number in g, uh, independent set in g, an independent set in h, and if I take those strong products, I'm not going to get any edges. So this is because uh, an independent set, strong product with an independent set, is another independent set. I can't get any edges here. And it's going to have size that product. So this uh, justifies sub or super multiplicativity. And in that case, the soup is the same as a limit. And I think this also says that if for some reason, if I were only using a bounded number of sizes, right, so if for some reason there, was a, there were a reason to use a bounded number of sizes, I could actually do better by basically using this property. Although I, I guess that doesn't answer the question for an infinite number of sizes. I don't know. Okay. So what do we do? What we just demonstrated was that if I look at the Shannon capacity of C5, our first example showed that this is at least the square root of 5. And this is because the independence number of C5 squared is 5. Now this may be surprising at first because we know that the independence number of C5 it's just two. So there are cases in which this independence number can become strictly big. It's really weird. So the first question is, what is C5? This was actually an open question for like 20 years. It's very difficult to come up with any upper bounds on this thing, on the Shannon capacity. So before going into a couple bounds, I just want to mention the following fact. We don't know if the Shannon capacity is computable. We have no idea. There is not even like a two approximation known, as far as I'm aware. There is, I think, if n is the number of vertices, I think you can get an order log n approximation. But there is no constant approximation even known to this thing that can be done in any amount of time, not just poly time. Yeah. So is there an example of a graph mm -hmm. where iterating this product procedure, it's known that it's never, no. it never becomes multiplicative? It isn't. So is there a graph where, this, where it's legit a soup and not a max? Yes. It is not known. It is not known. That we do not graph. know. There are, there's an infinite family of candidates, but no one knows. And that family of candidates, we actually know that this is true, that this is equal to root 5 will prove this. But if you ask me about theta of C7, we don't know what that is still. And we have a bound, and if the upper bound is correct, then that would be an example. Because the upper bound uh, is, can't be right, is transcendent. Uh, but no one knows. Uh, anyway, so it's not known to be computable. The weirder thing is you might, is it has been shown that if I say, all right, my algorithm is as follows, I am going to compute the first 10,000 powers of, you know, the graph and take the best one, right? It is known that that can't ever work for any value of 10,000. <laughs> Namely, you can construct graphs such that if you look at the graph of alpha of g, you know, to the n, 1 over n, and this is n, do whatever you want. Maybe it stays the same here, and then it jumps up here, and then it stays the same for a while, 
and then it jumps up a lot. And then it stays the same for, for like a long ass time. And then it decides to jump up here. In fact, for any finite number of these intervals, and also essentially gaps, you can construct a graph with dud, which does that. Oh, so you don't even know, like, once you see no, the once you see, behavior, that doesn't help you. Nope. Oh, no. It doesn't. I can make this be exactly the same for as long as I want to, and then have it jump up afterwards. Oh, horrible. Oh, yeah. It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. There are lots of conjectures, and we don't know anything. Never hope to come up with upper bounds. So let me mention a general upper bound. Uh, so general way to construct upper bounds. Let's say map. <coughs> Let's let f be a function from, uh, this is the space of all finite graphs. Uh, Let's say I have some function, and I want to try to come up with a way to argue that this function is, in fact, an upper bound on the Shannon capacity. Well, it might seem hard to do that, but in fact, we only need two properties. So f of g <coughs> is bigger than or equal to the Shannon capacity of g if two things are true. One, <coughs> well, f of course has to be bigger than or equal to the independence number. It's fairly trivial, right? because this is bigger than or equal to the independence number. And the second property is that it so-called subtensorizes. I'm going to call this subtensorize. I guess the reason we call this tensorize is sometimes the strong product is referred to as the tensor product. Reason being, if I look at the adjacency matrix, of the strong product of G and H, that's the same as the tensor product of the two adjacency matrices. So sometimes this is called the tensor product. All right, why does this tell me that F is in fact an upper bound on Shannon? Well, it's pretty easy. Proof, theta of G, this is super over N, alpha G of the N, one over N, but I know that this is less than or equal to, by the first property, n of f of g to the power of n, 1 over n. And then also f subtensorizes by induction, sup over n, f of g, but that's just f of g. And every single upper bound known on the Shannon capacity follows this rule. The funny thing is, the Shannon capacity itself does not follow this rule. So, uh, basically, we don't understand anything about the Shannon capacity. Questions so far? Well, let's what do give... we understand about the Shannon capacity? Hmm? What do we understand about the Shannon capacity? We know what uh, Shannon of C5 is. <laughs> There we go. Uh, we know what it is for a certain class of graphs that we'll prove right now. All right. So let's give um, an upper bound. Uh, I want to claim that it's upper bounded by the following thing. I'm going to rewrite the independence number of g as follows. I'm going to write it as actually an integer program. And then we'll relax it and show that actually this relaxation is <coughs> upper bound on Shannon by following this rule. So I can write the independence number as the maximum sum of x v, v and v x v, or some numbers assigned to each vertex, subject to the following. If I sum over all the vertices in a clique, so for every c a clique, <coughs> that's at most one, because an independent set can have at most one vertex of every clique. Um, and then lastly is that xv is either 0 or 1. So xv here is just telling us whether or not it's inside of the independent set or not. And this is just summing over the size. It gives me the size. And it is an independent set for because for every edge, well, those are cliques. I have at most one of the two endpoints. All right. Fortunately, this is hard. Let's give a relaxation. 
the most natural things to do is to say, I don't like integer programs, I like linear programs. So let's relax this to just saying that xv has to be bigger than or equal to zero, and upon doing that, we call it the fractional independence number. They are not the same. So one thing that's obvious is that the independence number is less than or equal to the fractional independence number, just because we have fewer conditions to satisfy. It doesn't have to be an integer in each of these values. You look confused, Andy. No, no, no. Okay. okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. I want to claim. Just what, what, what is xv? Sorry? What is xv X? is uh, any number. They're real numbers, uh, just any non negative reals. It's just a linear program. Right, so I'm, I'm maximizing over all of the XVs. So really, I'm maximizing over all XV. Subject to the following constraints. Okay. All right, I also want to claim that actually alpha sub f of g subtensorizes. Then we'd be okay, right? So I want to claim that alpha f g times h is at most alpha f of g, alpha f of h. In fact, they're equal, but let's just prove less than or equal to. So how can we do this? I mean, is this the one I want to do? Wait, is this? The, oh, okay. How do we do this? Uh, Right, so let's fix, we have some x, v, v, and v here. We have some y, v, uh, v of g, y, v, v, and v of h here. Right, these are the optimal uh, settings for this guy, and I want to construct a good setting for this. Well, is it vice versa? Oh, I do want to do it vice versa, don't I? Uh, I don't like that. Okay. Okay, sure. I really don't like that. Let's let's take the dual of this program. I don't like working with this. So the dual, all right, I'm fumbling around a bit, uh, called the fractional cleat cover number, is the min. Again, we're going to sum over all uh, C a cleat of some number assigned to C with the following constraint. I want it to be the case that I sum over all C's containing a vertex of YC. This should be at least one, and then finally all of these YC's are bigger than zero. So this is the natural relaxation of actual <coughs> clique cover number, which is the same as chromatic number of the complement. And by linear programming duality, these are actually the same number. Okay. So let's just replace it by cleat cover. We're not going to have a lot of time to do anything. Maybe I should skip this. <laughs> actually, let's skip this. So I don't have much time. Anyway, I don't know why I did all of this. Okay, okay it's true. Let's see what I'm talking about. of G is at most the fractional cleat cover number of G. Does this help us for C5? Well, you can actually compute this pretty easily for C5. And actually, the fractional cleat cover number of C5 is 5 minutes. It's not going to help you out. So now we know that the answer is somewhere between square root of 5 and 5 halves. It's not too far off. So how can we actually prove that the Shannon capacity of C5 is square root of 5? Well, it requires a magic person named Lovas and his invention of the following lines. Lovas the image. All right. So we first need a definition. Um, so if I take a bunch of vertices, let's say in some R to the N, such that V is a vertex on my graph, uh, we say this is an orthogonal representation of G if they're all unit vectors. 
Uh, and if I look at their inner product, so xu with xv, this is going to be 0 whenever uh, uv happens to be in, uh, is not an edge machine. So in some sense, I have an embedding of my graph into the unit sphere in some dimension. Now, you can always assume that n is, say, the number of vertices of g, because there will be n vectors, so it always lies in some subspace of dimension n. Where non-edges have to go to orthogonal pairs. So it's a good question just when these guys even exist. And here's the bound that Lobos gives. Theta, let's define little theta of g. This is, oh, also I guess I need uh, also another definition. This is easy, but we'll just use this uh, notation. H in Rn is a handle if it's just a unit vector. We'll explain why we like to call them handles in a second. All right. This is defined to be the minimum <clears throat> over all orthogonal reps and over all H handles, minimum over all of these, of the maximum over all the vertices of my graph, one over the inner product of xv with the handle squared. Yeah? What's n? Do you just pick a sufficiently large n that... Uh, yeah, you know, n is, is yeah, uh, really we're minimizing overall n, n is the number of vertices of the graph. Oh, okay. I mean, there are n vectors, right? So does one of these always exist if there are n vertices? So. Yeah, yeah, I could uh, just apply them all to a standard basis, right? Oh, yeah, right? of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, because g has n vertices, so one, it does exist in dimension n, and two, uh, you can always assume it's in dimension n, just, just take their span, right? Yeah, so just to, <clears throat> so the orthogonal representation is not an if and only if, right? You can have the case where two factors are orthogonal, but they are Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it, that won't hurt us. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think it has been shown that if you're going to be optimal for the theta function, it needs to be if and only if, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but no, we're, we're just saying if there is not an edge, they have to be. I don't really care if there are edges and they still are. It's, I, I don't really care. Okay, so we now define this weird function. And the claim is, it's an upper bound of the sh on the Shannon capacity. And if I plug in C5, I get square root of 5. So the first claim we should make is that little theta is bigger than or equal to big theta, which makes no sense. <laughs> Little is bigger than big, so whatever. Okay. So we need to do two things, right? We need to first show that it is in fact a bound on the independence number, and two, that it tens subtensorizes. Uh, let's do subtensorizing first. So if I say that I have some, you know, x, v, v, and v of g, and I have some y, v, uh, v, and v of g, sorry, h, let's say that these are orthogonal reps of their respective graphs, and I also have a handle, handles uh, little g and little h such that, you know, Shannon, uh, sorry, the boss theta of g is max over v and v and g. And similar for H. You know, they're similar things. So I want to claim that I can get a good orthogonal. I want to claim I can get good values for G times H. Well, the easy thing is, well, if I look at XV tensor Y, let's say XU tensor YV, such that U comma V. This uh, is an orthogonal rep for g times h. Why is that? If I'm not an edge in g times h, then I must not be an edge in one of the two graphs, which means that the, that respective component of my tensor product will give me a zero. And there's still unit vectors because I'm tensoring unit vectors. 
So this is an, ortho uh, an orthogonal representation. And then we're going to take the handle for this orthogonal representation just to be G tensor H. And what's going to happen if I plug it in? Well, the maximum over, I guess, U and V of G, V and V of H, of 1 over inner product of these tensors squared, Y V of G tensor H squared. Well, I can say this is less than or equal to 1 over, sorry, max V and V of G, 1 over X V with G squared of that. Right, tensor products factor over their products, and this guy right here is labeled G. And this just kind of uh, solidifies why we also like to call this a tensor product. Right? I have yeah. a question. Uh -huh. Just so looking at this definition of little theta, mm -hmm. I want to maximize this reciprocal. Right. So let's explain what it's doing. Okay. <laughs> so what are we doing is we have some handle, some vector h, and this is our handle. Now, this will explain why we call it a handle. Oh, what is this? The this is a projection. The minimum. The handle, yeah. okay, the handle's in the minimum. So this is a projection, right? This is a projection of these vertices onto this handle. So somewhere out here, I have a bunch of vertice, uh, vectors corresponding to G. This is the orthogonal rep of G. And if I project them and look at just the length of their projection, that's going to be the inner product squared of the two of them, because they're both unit vectors. Uh, I guess squared projection. And what is this saying? If I'm maximizing of 1 over, that says I want all of these things to be large. So in other words, this handle says I want this orthogonal representation, but I want them all to be roughly pointing in the same direction. And this H is that same direction. So that's kind of the philosophy behind this. So essentially, you're embedding them into some sort of spherical cap. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I was, yeah, more I, I was putting the H on the wrong part. Oh, of the no, yeah, it's the yeah, H for. Because if you maximize over the handle, you can just make it orthogonal and that will blow up the reciprocal. Exactly, because I have never fixed the dimension of my problem. Yeah. Okay. So we still need to prove that it's actually an upper bound on the independence number. And that's pretty straightforward. Let's say A is a subset of vertices that is independent. I want to do the following. We have our handle and we have our normal representation, we're talking representation. If I look at the norm of H squared, well, let's start with one. I can write that as the norm of my handle squared. But now, what's the case? If I look at the vertices in A, I know that xv, such that v is in A, this is orthonormal. Because it's an independent set, so I know that they're pairwise orthogonal and they're all normal vectors. So what could I do with this vector h is I could project it down onto this orthogonal set. And because I'm just looking at the norm, this is going to be bigger than or equal to the sum over all v in A, the inner product of A, xv squared. If this were actually an orthonormal basis, I would have equality here. But I don't actually. I just have an orthogonal set. So I'm just going to throw out some terms, and they're all positive, so I don't care. Great. But now, what is this thing? All of these are bigger than or equal to 1 over theta. Simply because what happened here, the maximum of 1 over those, that's, uh, I guess, bigger than or equal to theta, less than or equal to theta. There we go. Less than or equal to theta. Inverting that, you get bigger than or equal to theta. OK, this is size of A over theta. And we're done. Yeah? Wait, I'm sorry. Is H the handle that's minimized that is used? As yeah, yeah. So what I'm using here is that the x, v, and the h are minimizing everything. Yeah, they're, they're the optimal solutions. You know that the uh, min is actually attained because, right, where you can pretend that we're always in dimension n, so just use compactness and you're good. We don't have an infinite dimensional problem. Okay, so it is a bound on chain. All right, so how?
how do you get theta of c is 5 and the square root of 5? Well, the philosophy is called the umbrella idea. They call it the umbrella proof. Let's start by drawing c5 in the plane in just kind of the natural way, right? I could draw a pentagon in the plane, a regular pentagon. And now I'm going to think of my handle as the z, as the, uh, the z vector. Well, this is going to be bad. This is not an orthonormal representation. But I could think about pulling these vectors out, folding down my umbrella, until these two vectors become orthogonal. That's going to happen at some point, because this is bigger than 90 degrees, and they're going to end up as the same vector if I keep doing it forever. Eventually, they will end up being orthogonal. So I'm going to have an orthonormal representation, and then you have to do a lot of really annoying trigonometry, and it turns out that uh, when this becomes an orthogonal representation, the z-coordinate of each of these vectors, we have something, something, and then the fourth root of five. This follows from like spherical cosine laws. I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so that means that one over xv with h squared, well h here is just e3. And this is, oh wait, sorry, not the fourth, one over the fourth. You guys should correct me. Come on, you know what I'm gonna say. There we go, that makes sense. How could I be the fourth root of five on a unit vector? Come on. This is square root of five. All right. Great. So you get that little theta of C5 is at most square root of five. You know that it's bigger than or equal to big theta of C5. And we already knew that this was bigger than or equal to square root of five. So we're good. We can also get interesting things, such as a little the, uh, the Lovas theta function applied to any graph is at most that fractional cleat cover number as well. So it actually does straightly better in those cases. All right, uh, let me just write down the best bound for any odd cycle. Yeah. So uh, oh, go ahead, do that first, I guess. Okay. Turns out little theta of c n n is odd. Uh, we actually know the answer for all n even. It's n over 2. I didn't finish the cleat cover number thing, but that'll get it to you. This is equal to n times the cosine of pi over n. 1 plus the cosine of pi over n. And there we go. This is not done by the same technique. You have to do a lot more work to get this. It's not known that this is actually the Shannon capacity, but this answer is ambient. If this is the right answer for Shannon, this would be an example of where you uh, don't have a maximum there. This can't be achieved at any finite point. Sorry, your well, question. It's, it's not clear that those are transcendental, though. Yeah, you can prove it. Or all you have to do is show that it's not a root, right? All you have to do is just show that any power is not an integer, and then you're good. Because Shannon is an nth root, right? So if it's achieved, so you don't even have to say transcendental. It's not a root, okay. Yeah, even easier. They're, I don't know if they're transcendental, but they probably are. <laughs> Anything that isn't, you know, automatic. Of course, if I plugged in <laughs> n equals 5 there, I would also claim that that's transcendental. I guess not, though. But <laughs> whatever. You got a question? So, so based, on, based on that, there's no real satisfactory reason why it seemed why it just coincidentally uh, coincided with... Um, with the second, with the second tensor products. Yeah, there's there is no good reason. Oh. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we I, I could be wrong about this, but we do not even have an example of a graph whose Shannon capacity is determined who is not determined by either its independence number or the independence number of its square. We we don't even have an example where the it's determined by say the independence number of its cube. We we don't. We know nothing about this parameter, and it's frustrating. Uh, 
there is no graph where, let's say, the third independence capacity is strictly bigger than the first two? No, there is. Yeah. But we don't know that it's equal to. That's that's all I'm saying. Oh, that it's equal to. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that was... I yeah. see, I see. We, we don't know, so there are certainly ones where it's bigger than, I think you... Actually, I'm not sure if the constructions tell you that where you start that last table that that's the answer. I'm, I'm unsure about that. Uh, okay, so I want to pose a question. Are these two things equal? This will be my last ten minutes. No. No. They're not equal, but it actually took a while to come up with a counterexample. I mean, isn't it automatic because a uh, little theta is um, <laughs> subtensorizing? And right, but that wasn't known. It wasn't known. Oh, it's when only Lovos... big theta. Right, so, okay. so at the point, Lovos ended his thing with a bunch of questions. One of them is if this was true. They, they got substantially weaker. The second one was whether or not big theta subtensorizes. Oh, well, actually, yes, if it actually tensorizes, because Lovos theta, you can prove it actually tensorizes. Um, not too hard. Uh, and then he just kept getting weaker and weaker, but at that time it wasn't actually known that there was that big theta does not subtensorize. It super tensorizes, that's easy to prove. Wasn't known if it subtensorized. Until we come to the only other general bound. The hammer's bound, as it's called. And let's uh, talk about this quickly, it's pretty fast, and we'll give a counterexample to this. Although I won't prove part of it. So let's do the following. Uh, let's fix a field F. And what we want to do is we want to come up with a bunch of matrices. We have G and graph. And let's think about matrices uh, whose rows and columns are ind indexed by the vertices. Let's kind of try to replicate this idea of the orthogonality. We're going to say that M fits G if the following is true. One. The diagonal entries are non-zero, and two, MUV is equal to MVU is zero whenever there's not an edge. So this is similar to the orthogonality, but not actually, because I'm not requiring that the matrix itself is a graph matrix. In fact, this matrix can be uh, not symmetric. The claim is, ah, Oops, I haven't defined the parameter. Hammer's then defined. Let's call it H of G with respect to the field F. And this is the minimum over all M that fit G over the field F of the rank of M. Look at all the matrices which fit G over this F. Look at the rank over that field. This is an upper bound on Shannon. So first, subtensorizing is easy. Why? Well, because if I take the tensor product of two of these guys, if this fits G and this fits H, well, then this guy fits their tensor product. That's easy. Zero times anything is zero. The diagonals are going to be non-zero because we're over a field. And also the rank of the tensor product, well, that tensorizes. And it's an upper bound on the independence number, because if I gave you an independent set in the big matrix, say that this A, that's an independent set, well, what does this have to look like? Well, on the diagonal, we have not zeros. And on the off diagonal, there are no edges, so we must have zeros. So I have, an ind I have a matrix of rank size of A inside of there. That's the independence number. So the rank must be at least the independence number. Are you happy? So all of this, you know, all of my hand waving implies that in fact that this is a countering machine. <clears throat> my last five minutes, let's give a count. In fact, you can come up with counterexamples over most fields. You can also come up with them over the reals, but I'm just going to give you one over F. Sorry, with, with this guy right here. So let's define 
Uh, I'm going to call it J and P. J stands for Johnson, as it comes from Johnson's. Uh, the vertices is going to be all subsets of size P plus 1, coming from bracket N. And we're going to say that S is adjacent to T for two of these subsets if, uh, if and only if, the size of their intersection is not zero mod P. Really, I don't care if it's P plus 1, but just anything not divisible by P. Yeah, sorry, could you remember what's bracket N? Bracket N in the set of integers 1 through N. Oh, okay. Yeah. How do we do this? Well, we just have to come up with a good matrix over FP. And let's just take the inspits matrix. So let's say that uh, M is the matrix where, I have to think about which way I want to do this. I think I want, right, so here I'm going to write bracket N choose P plus 1, and over here, so rows are indexed by bracket N, columns are indexed by all the subsets, right, so this is the same as V of J and P. And we put a 1 if and only if I is contained in S, right? For the sense of yeah. Just the <coughs> instance matrix. What happens if I look at M transpose times M? Well, we're taking the inner products of all of the columns. So this is going to be indexed bracket N P plus 1 by bracket N choose P plus 1. And the entry, the, say, st entry, is going to be the size of s intersect t, but we're over fp, modulo p. So let's just check that this guy does, in fact, fit the graph. Well, on the diagonal, this is always 1, so we're good there. On the off-diagonal, well, if uv is not an edge, that means that the intersection of s and t is 0 mod p, so we get a 0. So this matrix does, in fact, fit G over FP. And what's its rank? Well, the rank, rank of M transpose M, well, that's the same as the rank of M. And M has at most N rows, so its rank is at most N. So in fact, there can be a huge discrepancy between the Lobos theta function and the Although, in general, the hammer's minimum rank is awful. First thing, it's always an integer. That's no fun. Second thing is the Lovas theta function. It turns out that you can actually write it down as a semi-definite program. So at least in theory, you can compute it in polynomial time. Uh, the hammer's minimum rank is technically computable, but uh, not going to be any fun. Definitely an empty hard problem. I don't have a proof of that, but it's definitely empty. Over most fields. Like, you have to solve a giant system of polynomial equations, basically. It's not fun. Uh, other things that the theta function satisfies that Hammers doesn't, when the theta function was less than or equal to the fractional clique cover number, it's not true about Hammers. It's less than or equal to the clique cover, but not the fractional version. Namely, because we said clique, fractional clique cover of, say, C5, you know, this is 5 halves. But I know that hammers of C5 is at least theta of C5, which is root 5, but hammers is an integer, and that's 3, so that's a bit bad. It is less than clique cover number, but I'm out of time, right, son? When does this sound? You don't know? Yeah, anyway, there are lots of weird things. Last thing, I'll pitch a recent paper of Boris and mine where we have a generalization of the hammers bound, which does everything you would want. So in fact, our generalization is in fact less than the clique, fractional clique cover number. And the hammer's bound also subtensorizes, but it doesn't tensorize. The generalization does tensorize. And I don't know, it's fun. So I'll just uh, you know, plug a little paper. And there it is. Yeah. I guess the last question is what's theta is C7? If not, let's nice thank Chris again.
<laughs> throw something. <laughs> All right, my one question is, I gathered this within the 